Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death. This episode is on my playlist, Deadly Destinations, where we visit the sites of terrible events. Sometimes they're murders, and sometimes they're mass murders. Today I'm coming to you from the West Mesa of Albuquerque, New Mexico, where in 2009 a mass grave was found. The bodies of 11 women and one fetus were discovered by a woman walking her dog in a park. I'm going to take you on a little tour of the area and we're going to discuss the case. Then as we always do in our deadly destination, we're going to eat. This is Dining with Death. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. Well, I have to start out by apologizing. I've got a terrible cold, but I have waited as long as I can possibly wait to record this voiceover, so please forgive me. This is Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm going to save our tour of downtown Albuquerque for the haunted episode we filmed here about the legend of La Llorona, which is one of my favorite ghost stories. You'll get to see a lot of old town and a lot of historic sites in that video. Today, I'm really going to focus on this one particular area of Albuquerque, the West Mesa. The West Mesa is a large, flat, elevated landmass that sits west of the Rio Grande River. It stretches from South Albuquerque northward to Bernalillo. It's the easternmost extent of the Colorado Plateau. There are lots of petroglyphs in the West Mesa area, and part of it belongs to Petroglyph National Monument. For millions of years, the West Mesa sat desolate, home to nothing but wildlife and cactus and the occasional human traveler. But in the last 20 years, it has exploded with growth and development. There are now more than 20 subdivisions on the West Mesa, thousands of homes and enough students to fill four high schools in that area alone. In Albuquerque, there is a street called East Central Avenue, and it's a known corridor for prostitution and drug sales. The people that frequent East Central live tough lives, and it is not uncommon for people to go missing in that area. But in the early 2000s, the problem became much more significant. Before long, it was very apparent. Someone was taking and killing working girls in Albuquerque. But who? And where were they taking them to? On May 11, 2003, Monica Candelaria went missing after being last seen near Atrisco and Central. Police searched for her but did not find her, and soon her case was cold. In October of that same year, 2003, Doreen Marquez was last seen dropping her child off at school. She was never seen again. Early in 2004, Victoria Chavez disappeared from her mother's house, but no one reported her missing for a year. February 15, 2004, Veronica Romero went missing after seeing her family for Valentine's Day. In April of 2004, Jamie Barella and her cousin, Evelyn Salazar, went to a park near San Mateo. The two girls left a family gathering to go meet some friends at the park. Both girls vanished and were never seen again. May of 2004, Solania Edwards, only 15 years old, was last seen working in a high prostitution area near East Colfax in Aurora, Colorado, and it's assumed she ran away to Albuquerque. In June of 2004, Virginia Cloven called her father and told him that she was moving in with her new boyfriend. No one ever saw her again. Virginia was reported missing four months after she disappeared. In July of 2004, Cinnamon Elks vanished after being arrested and detained. A month later, Julie Nieto disappeared. September 22, 2004, 21-year-old Michelle Valdez sees her mother for the last time. She is not reported missing until February the following year. With each missing woman, it becomes more and more apparent that something is very, very wrong in Albuquerque. The police decide to begin looking into the disappearances as though they are linked. And in August of 2005, they create a flyer like this for each woman who has vanished. Then, on December 17, 2006, something major happens. This is Lorenzo Montoya. He had a long arrest history that included several instances of him hiring undercover police women disguised as prostitutes. He was also known to be violent. On the night of December 17th, Lorenzo hired an escort to come to his trailer. When she didn't return to her boyfriend, he went looking for her. The boyfriend went to the trailer and immediately knew something wasn't right. As he got closer, he saw her. There was his girlfriend, bound by the wrists and ankles, with duct tape, wrapped in plastic wrap, and partially covered with a blanket, laying outside of Lorenzo's trailer. Lorenzo was in the process of moving her body. 
The boyfriend was armed and he shot and killed Lorenzo Montoya. There are people who strongly believe that Lorenzo Montoya is the serial killer known as the West Mesa Bone Collector. There are those who do not believe he is the right suspect, and no case has ever formally been made because obviously he's dead. But officers say that even if he weren't, there probably wouldn't be enough evidence to charge him in the murders. For years, no one knew what happened to the 11 missing women. No one had any way of knowing that they were laying in the dirt on the outskirts of Albuquerque in an undeveloped part of town under the big New Mexico skies on the West Mesa. As their bones lay on the desert floor, construction continued, and soon what was once a very desolate and far outlying area was becoming part of the city. On February 9, 2009, a woman named Christine Ross was walking her dog, Ruka, out on the West Mesa. As Ruka was sniffing along, enjoying the walk, he stopped, and Christine paused to look down at the ground. There lay, clearly visible, a human femur. Christine immediately called the police, who arrived and cordoned off the area. They then began to excavate. Word quickly spread to the media and then the public. Later that same day, a woman named April Gillen called the police and told them that she had been holding on to a secret that she couldn't keep any longer. April had long suspected that her ex-husband, this man named Joseph Blay, to be the West Mesa bone collector. April said her husband was violent and she knew that he used the West Mesa as a dumping site for his landscaping business. She suspected dirt and trees and gravel weren't all he was dumping out there. On the day the femur was found, the police worked through the afternoon and very shortly began finding more bones. Then they found an entire skeleton intact. At this point, they were quite sure. They knew where all the missing women had gone. Investigators continued to excavate and they continued to find them, body after body, skeleton after skeleton. They were standing on the dumping site of a serial killer. Just one day after the discovery of the femur, the first identification was made. On February 10th, 2009, Victoria Chavez was identified using her dental records. Over the next few days and then weeks, the other bodies were given names. With the exception of runaway Solania Edwards, who was black, the victims were Hispanic. Tragically, Michelle Valdez was four months pregnant at the time of her murder. Her bones were found with the forming bones of her fetus. With the discovery of the bodies and with all of the murdered identified, the investigation went into high gear. Police had a lot of work to do now that they had verified each of their missing women was in fact a homicide victim. They spent months retracing their steps, talking to their friends and family members, and piecing together their last days. Of course, they were also investigating suspects. On June 11, 2009, the police executed a search warrant here at suspect Joseph Blee's house. They seized all of his computers, his financial records, and all of his landscaping equipment. What the public didn't know at the time is that found with one of the bodies was the tag off of a tree, like a new tree that you would purchase at the nursery for landscaping. Now, we already know that Joseph Blay would use the West Mesa for dumping his landscaping debris, so that tag could have come from that. But police wanted to see if they could tie the tree directly to Joseph Blay and then begin to build a case against him. The next day, the police informed the public that all 11 deaths had been ruled homicide, but manner of death could not be determined in nine of the 11 cases because the bodies were too decomposed. In October of 2009, the police execute a second search warrant on Joseph Blee's house. This time, they find a stash of women's underwear and jewelry. They also searched his jail cell. Joseph Blay was found guilty of four sexual assaults totally unrelated to the West Mesa Boneyard, so he was already locked up. Police also found rope and duct tape on the passenger seat of his vehicle. A year goes by and police announce they have a third suspect. He is a Missouri man named Ron Irwin. Ron traveled frequently to Albuquerque for business. After a search warrant is executed, investigators discover that Irwin was not in Albuquerque during many of the times the women disappeared and were killed. 
Police then hold a press conference and inform the public that Joseph Blay has been tied to more sexual assaults, dating clear back to the 1980s. So now the two official suspects are Lorenzo Montoya, who is dead, and Joseph Blay, who's already in prison. Despite having two suspects and all of the bodies identified, the case then goes cold. The police are frustrated, the public is frustrated, but there is simply nowhere else to turn. In November of 2014, the lead detective on the case retires and a new one is assigned to the case. Joseph Blay is tried and convicted and although that's another case, he will never get out of prison. But we still need to know who is the West Mesa bone collector. We drove out of Albuquerque and into the outskirts headed to the West Mesa. I struggled with how to say this as nicely as possible. Albuquerque feels like a city on the verge. This is the second time I visited here. There's lots of culture and lots of history, but it always feels like, I don't know, like they're about to run out of money or something here. There are a lot of vacant commercial spaces. I'm sure COVID had something to do with that. And unlike a lot of cities this size, the parks and the overpasses, the medians in the street, they're just not as manicured as you might expect. The crime rate is also very high here. The flip side, there are very luxurious areas, beautiful areas, and of course, the fabulous hot air balloon festival that happens here each year. We didn't have time to drive by the Breaking Bad house and get yelled at by the lady who lives there. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole thing. Look it up on TikTok. The people here are very, very nice. Great people who work hard and take a lot of pride in their homes and businesses. And it's my understanding that a new tech wave is coming to Albuquerque. So hopefully that will be an influx of cash. A lot of people really like it here. And I think if you can afford to live in the nicer areas, it would be a nice place. It almost feels like there are lines, visible lines in the city. It's very much a city of the haves and the have nots. You've kind of seen what I'm talking about here in the Women's Memorial Park. The city designated this location as a park to remember the victims. It feels kind of half done as we walk through it. My husband and I were guessing at what this area here would become. He said there would definitely be steel poles going down into each of these prepared slots, and he was correct. Just recently, these beautiful leaf structures were added to the memorial. Isn't this nice? And here's something very cool. On the date of the memorial, each year, the sun will shine directly onto the center and onto this inscription. I think that's beautiful. As the park matures and the trees grow, I think this will become a really nice place to sit and remember these women. As you walk the path around the perimeter of the park, you come to marker after marker, each engraved with the name of the victim it represents. People leave flowers and stuffed animals and notes. We were the only people here on the day we visited. Mesas, plateaus, they're usually windy places because they're elevated, and this location is no exception. As I walked the path and thought about these women, I could hear in my mind the wheels of the killer's truck on the dirt. I imagined him stepping out of the vehicle and slamming the car door, and I heard the sounds of him dragging these poor women to where he dumped them. It was eerie. This is an eerie place. I was actually very surprised at the neighborhood just across the street. I don't know why it surprised me to learn that there were people living right here, but it did. I'm sure things feel very different past the neighborhood wall. But this place, it feels very eerie, sad, and mournful. They've placed a beautiful monument stone at the opening of the park, and there's a special inscription for the unborn child. There are a lot of benches to sit and enjoy the solitude of the park, and that made me happy. It's nice to know that the family members and friends of the victims, or just those who want to remember the women, can come sit here and spend time. This is just a really sad story, and you feel that sadness and the heaviness when you're here. The great loss of life is tragic, and it's exacerbated by the fact that there has been no justice for these victims. Justice never replaces the loss of life, but it brings a measure of closure, or at least offers closure to those who have been affected. I know no one wants this case solved more than the men and women of the Albuquerque Police Department and the families, and I'm sure it's very frustrating for them to have information, to have suspects, and to be unable to close the case. But until something changes very drastically, there will be no justice for these victims. For now, we wait. 
We wait and we wonder, and we hope that one day someone will be able to answer this question. Who is the West Mesa Bone Collector? Now, as we always do here on this playlist, we eat in our deadly destination. This is a dark travel show, and we incorporate all aspects of travel here on this playlist. We love a seafood boil, and even though we are in the middle of the southwestern desert, we were told this place was really good, and it was. This is the Cracking Crab. We both ordered the shrimp and crab boil, and the server looked at us and said, you want two? And we were like, yeah, we, we always get two. <laughs> Well, the Kraken Crab is not like most places. We got so much food that we ate on this for three days in our hotel room. The crab was delicious, well seasoned and perfectly cooked. The shrimp and the mussels were fantastic and the service was outstanding. If you're in Albuquerque, you definitely need to hit this spot. This is one of the best seafood boils we've ever had. I hope that someday in the future, I can return to this place with an update. I hope I can report to you that the case has been solved and that long awaited justice has been brought to the families and the victims. But for now, we can only remember them and think about what was done to them many years ago as they were left alone under the big skies of the Albuquerque desert. They were there for so long waiting to be found and now they are waiting for their killer to be revealed. I think it's safe to say we all want that same thing. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, Deadly Destinations. Hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more from me. It does help. You can also join my Patreon and there will be some bonus content there for you if you do. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.